have to show you the coolest thing that my mom made me. It's like a little 3D piano. And she made that. Thanks, Mom. Let's talk about string arranging, which is a question I actually get asked a lot. So I've got a five part string ensemble that I wrote for accompaniment to Home to Me. And there is a general kind of build that I actually like to do in most of my songs anyway, whether it's score, an instrumental, or in this case with vocals, where it kind of starts out simple and the, the arc kind of goes like this. That's that's not the best way. It kind of, the, the whole thing sort of arcs. So there's a point in the, usually two thirds of the way through the song maybe where it builds and it's at its loudest. And also if we're talking about strings, the strings are also sort of at their kind of widest intervals. And then I like kind of tapering back down at the end. And that's exactly what I did with this arrangement. So I've got MIDI strings doing ensemble things. First violin, second violin, viola, cello, and bass. And I'm using the Spitfire chamber strings, which is just a really nice um, small ensemble sound. I'm just using the default legato with the regular tree mics and I guess the only thing I really did is I have the vibrato turned all the way up because I wanted to have a lot of vibrato. But other than that, nothing really fancy. And what I really like about the Spitfire chamber strings is it's a very small violin section. So when you're talking about pop music, if you could classify this song as pop, <laughs> um, I didn't need a huge epic orchestra sound. I wanted something more intimate where you could really hear the vibrato and you could hear the legato transitions and I wanted it to sound like a, a small string orchestra that I would have if I were choosing to do this live. So that's what all the blue is up here and we'll step through it basically. I committed it to audio just so I could do a little bit of editing and then I also added a live first, second violin and viola from Jeff Ball who played all the solo violin for me for the solo parts in the score as well. So if we start at the verse, I'm going to use this view so that you can see the chords up here. A lot of the way I like to write with strings and with brass is kind of having as many common notes as possible when the chords are moving around. Even if that means there's maybe an added tone in there, like this E is not part of this D chord, but it's just sort of in there. And then the top and bottom voices are shifting to the notes in the D chord, just a D and an A. Back to a D here, and then here's the G. So there's only one note that shifts on the bottom and the top. So keeping kind of the, the structure of the chord in terms of where it's sitting, I'm gonna say on the keyboard, since we're looking at a keyboard view here, it helps it feel smooth, as opposed to doing something like, let's say, um, if you're going from D to G, having all these notes jump from D, and then this jumps to this jumps up to here and this one jumps up to here. Having everything jump, I like to keep things as connected as possible. And I think that helps a lot with the sound. That's just kind of proper arranging is done that way. And you just have a nice smooth sound. It sounds connected. So there's kind of two ways that I think about writing for strings. And one of them is like this, where You've got your first and second violins and violas basically doing triads pretty tightly, as, as close as you could get them. And then there's a bass line. And in this case, I think the, the basses actually come in here. This is probably just cellos, or there may be basses doubling it in the exact same octave. But the idea is you've got a root or a bottom note, if it's playing an inversion, that goes down here. And it's completely separate from what the 
kind of top three strings, violas, violins two, and violins one are playing. And I just have them move as smoothly as I can and play through those harmonies. You can see E minor to G, so it's just a small stepwise motion. We go to the A, everyone's got to move, but they move as little as possible to get to the next chord. Down to the G, back down to the E minor, and everything's in this general register. And we get to the kind of break section, which is just an E minor chord with just scale. One, two, three, four, a scale going up. So then I open it up and it's a lot wider, which is kind of the other half of my thinking behind string voicing is a really wide open kind of a sound. So the bass is just moving up the scale, one, two, three, four, and I believe that's violin one, that's violin two, and this is viola. So the viola is kind of pedaling on this five from E minor. It's pedaling on the, the B natural, and everything else is moving up in scale tones, basically. Another example of this would be at the end. And I'm going to play these once we get to the audio section. This is the beginning of the first full chorus, very close kind of writing. And then here, the violins are in octaves just playing a little counter melody kind of thing. And all the bass is doing, again, in octaves, are just doubling the bass line. And for the final chorus, you can see it's the same idea as I had at the beginning. It's just a little thicker. The low strings are in octaves, but you've got that same close triadic kind of writing here in the top three strings. And then we've got some octaves again with the melody line and the same kind of build at the end. Let me just play you an idea of what the strings sound like on their own. You get a real nice sense of that kind of intimate, close sound. And I did a little bit, it is a little bit, I promise, a little bit of effects on the contact instance that has the chamber strings. You can see the needles are just moving a little bit on the compressors. It's just a little bit goes a long way. And this is more for a little bit of compression. This one is more for some tube and a little bit of compression. Ducking out some lower mids, some more lower mids and a little bit of 1.6. And then the Neve is pulling down more at basically 2K, 1.9K. And a shelf, a shelf at seven kilohertz giving a little bit of a boost there. And again, I've mentioned before how much I love Neve for boosting. It's just really, really nice. So if we turn everything off and play that same section again, I'm gonna 
turn both these compressors on, which is going to give it a little bit of gain as well, but you'll see the needles moving just a tiny bit. And that compression is there not to make it sound like it's compressed or to make it sound bigger than life the way you would do it like on a drum set or like on a big fat lead vocal for a rock tune. It's there to just make the level constant so that certain notes are going to poke out and be a little louder, other notes are going to be quieter, and it's just those are smoothing everything out volume wise so that you can hear the strings in the track consistently. This is actually boosting a little bit of the top end. So you can hear that telephone-ish frequency right here, the kind of two to two and a half kilohertz is getting cut and then a little bit of top end sheen. And then these are just more corrective EQ than anything else. And a lot of this has to do not with me making the strings sound the way I hear them in my head or anything, but making them sit in the track. Because there's a lot going on. There's seven or eight instruments and a lead vocal and accompaniment vocals and just a lot happening. And I want the strings to sound like they're kind of forward and not take up too much clutter in the lower end, like <laughs> anywhere. So a lot of it's like scooping things and getting it so that it just kind of sits naturally in the space which is where this guy comes in as well. I, I love having the Aphex and it really helps things sort of spill out into the mix. And it almost sounds like too much when you're listening to the strings by themselves, but I promise you, I did this as I was listening to the entire mix and it really helped it bring it forward. And then I've got the Bricasti, which is on my favorite large hall setting. Nice and subtle, but gorgeous. So that's the idea behind the MIDI strings. And what I did was I committed those to audio and then had an extra two EQs, which looks like the exact same thing I had on the other ones. I just doubled down because I wanted to have a little more. just kind of cleaning it up a little bit and smoothing it out a little bit more. And I think I probably literally copied and pasted those two FabFilter EQs from the previous one. And to be clear, the chamber strings, the previous effects we were just looking at, these were all applied to the contact instrument itself. And then once I rendered everything as individual tracks, I bust those out to here, which is why it's called MIDI strings. And then I added two more. EQs. So what we were just listening to is the bounced or rendered audio files with a little bit of extra EQ on it. So let me go back to the beginning. We can talk a little bit about continuous controllers. So here you can see the chords and the string voicing.
it's not a huge secret or anything, but I love starting with two voices. We get to the second verse, add a third voice before we get to kind of the, the first statement of the chorus, which I just called half chorus. I add a fourth voice so that by the time you get here, I essentially have my four part writing sussed out and ready to go. Even though there's five instruments, most of the time I've, in this case, I have the cellos and basses doing the same thing. Nice tight triadic writing here with just the bass, and I believe I've got a sine wave on that contrabass line as well because I wanted it to be able to sound nice and big and beefy. So when the band came in with the electric bass, it was a kind of a match the way they both work. So let's look at the two choruses and how they differ. So this is the first chorus. And it's first and second violins doubling the same note and viola on the bottom. And then we get to our usual kind of counter melody here with the basses and cellos and octaves. So it's basically just two part harmony. And really, the melody line is just outlying triads of the chords. So from E minor, we've got the G and the E, to a G with a B and a G, to an A with an A and an E, a little passing tone. Oh, nope, there's a D chord there. So I've got the third, which also works as a passing tone, back up to the E minor again, same line, essentially. It's just a matter of having a slightly different harmony so since there's a slightly different harmony here with the C major 7, the notes are a little lower. And we're just outlying triads the whole time. I just kind of put it in a slightly interesting rhythm that gave it a little bit of shape and then phrased the continuous controllers in a four bar phrase, which is normally the way I do my, my CC writing for strings. Just a little bit of a push at the beginning, a little bit of a pull at the end, just it seems to make it fairly smooth and keep it connected. So if we go to the second chorus and take a look, this is the last statement of the chorus itself. And I wanted it to seem like it was bigger, even if only subtly so. So here's the strings for the second final chorus. That's a lot more lush and a lot thicker because we've got all three parts playing in that nice tight triad. And a lot of times this works really well in this register right here. No matter what chords are going by from E to G to A to E to C major seven, everything's kind of staying in this little block. And I've just found through studying orchestration, both stuff from film music and a lot of classical stuff, that's just a really nice meaty register for the strings, especially if you're talking orchestra. There aren't any French horns on here, but if they were, I would literally have the French horns double this exact same voicing right here. That, that starts getting a little high depending on the dynamic for the horns, but this is a great register for French horns. And if you double it with strings, literally first violin, second violin, viola, and then you have either horn one, two, and three, or like horn one and two, three and four, five and six, because I love doing horns 
in groups of six. For this very reason, triadic writing for six horns is just a beautiful thing. It's a really powerful, like lush kind of a sound. The last thing I did, which honestly is what you hear a little more of in the track in the final version, is Jeff doubled first, second violin and viola for me with his live instrument. So it's a solo violin playing the first two violin parts, a solo viola playing the viola part. This is a great trick that I love to do if there's not budget for live strings, but I know I want to have that kind of intimate close sound. If I were doing a big orchestra thing, it might be a little trickier using a solo player. I'd have to push him back a little more in the mix and try to get him to blend with the section a little bit more, but I've done that before as well, and it does really work nicely. It just kind of sits on top of the MIDI and makes it feel like it's live, like it kind of covers up the flaws that you've got with funky, just things that MIDI can't do that well, and a live player just does naturally. So a lot of it really comes down to your budget and what kind of a sound you're looking for. With this, I actually had Jeff's parts pretty forward in the mix because that's the kind of sound that I wanted to get. I wanted it to kind of sound like a trio of string players and then the MIDI was used to kind of give it like a little more roundness and thickness. And literally, I just sent him the MIDI parts and he doubled up on them. And I'll start us right here where we've got some movement in the MIDI. It's pretty obvious that having a live person play that with all those beautiful inconsistencies and nuanced performance things that samples just don't do. If, if I had one complaint about samples, they're too perfect. It really makes me crazy because everything is perfectly in tune and perfectly quantized and you're taking all the human emotion out of it. And I'm not saying I want samples to not be in tune, but you know, there's something to be said for not tuning everything perfectly. A lot of times when I sampled my orchestra sounds, I would only tune them if it really stuck out as being, whoa, that tube is a little flat or a little sharp, where something popped out in the mix as being wrong. But if it wasn't perfectly in tune, that was kind of fine with me because it sounds more like a live orchestra. Maybe the best, 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 best live orchestras in the world and the ones I would work with if I were at Abbey Road or at Skywalker, most of the time can play in tune, but I promise you even then, especially when they're sight reading, there's gonna be little funky notes here and there and transitions and things aren't gonna be quite perfect. And I love that. That's what I really wanna go for. And that was kind of the philosophy, getting Jeff to play these. I didn't do a thing to them. I left them completely alone. So you heard some different things popped out here and there with the vibrato and transitions were maybe a little early or a little late and uh, microscopic, darling, microscopic. You know, it was a Jeff Goldblum, you know, Jurassic Park imperfections in the skin. I don't mean that Jeff did a bad job. He did an amazing job. Jeff is a human being. Those are the kinds of inconsistencies or imperfect things that I'm talking about. And I left them. So when you blend them with the strings, I've intentionally got them forward in the mix, not as reverby, a little more top end, 
The idea is just to really help homogenize them with the section. And if we went on to something a little more lyrical, like the chorus, if I play it without Jeff, and with Jeff, And honestly, I was really on the fence with just nixing the MIDI strings 100% because I love the way his violin and viola sounded. But it, when I took them out, it kind of sounded too stark, like it was too thin. So the reason you can't hear the MIDI violins and violas that well once Jeff comes in was sort of my compromise. I didn't want them to be as upfront as his live playing, but I wanted them to support him in the sense of giving him you know, a little bit of uh, kind of thickness behind what he was doing. And it's very evident when you have something like this. especially that vibrato at the end that you heard that really makes a huge difference. Let's quickly take a look at the microphones that I had a choice of, because I think stuff like this is always very interesting to me. So I sent Jeff two different microphones because I wanted to have a choice between two different sort of timbres from his instrument. I sent him a 414, which this is a super classic, completely flat industry workhorse. This is the uh, B-U-L-S, meaning there's different versions of this because it's been around forever. This is the version that has a transformer in it, which to me is very important. There's a B-U-L-S-2 that's a transformerless mic, but unlike my 149 over here, which is also a transformerless mic. It's a transformerless tube mic, and having that transformer missing just means it's super quiet and really transparent, and then the tube is warming everything up. When you're talking about a standard condenser mic, I want something with a transformer in it, which is where this comes into play. I have two of these. These are great for overheads for drum sets. Uh, they're really great for recording just about anything. And they're really, really flat, like to the point where you'll want to boost some of the top end starting at 1K with a big shelf because they're so flat. But it works really well when you're trying to record small or high instruments because they're really smooth on the top end. So this was mic number one. And I believe I even drew a picture or something like that and had him position one microphone, I think it was the 414, the furthest away, like as far away as he could get in the room. It was maybe eight feet. And then for the close-up mic, I had the Bee's Knees, which is basically like a KM84, a Neumann KM84, another super standard small diaphragm condenser. And the KM84s you can't get anymore. They stopped making them like in the 70s, I think. And they're just really, really sweet sounding small microphones. And the general idea is the smaller the diaphragm on the mic, the quicker it can respond to transient. So you're gonna get more detail. It doesn't mean it picks up more highs than a large diaphragm. It just means it's picking up more detailed highs. So the idea is between the 414, which was a large diaphragm further away, and then the basically reproduction of a KM84, which is this bee's knees, um, what's it called? I think it's just called a bee's knees. I think that's actually the model. This one's far away, this one's up close, and you're kind of getting a really smooth distant sound and a much more detailed close mic sound. So that's what we're looking at when it comes to these microphone choices here. Got a bee's knees and a 414. Let's hear the difference just on the chorus between the two mics. Originally, I thought that I would be 
taking both of them and playing them at the same time and just adjusting the level. So if I wanted a little more top end, I'd turn up the bee's knees. If I wanted a little less top end, I'd pull down the bee's knees. As it turned out, since Jeff was playing a violin and a viola, I actually had different kind of acoustic characteristics that I liked about each microphone. And I remember the 414, being very smooth like that, and the bee's knees. The 414 has a little more kind of lower, upper, mid-range, and it's a lot smoother on the top end. As soon as I switched to the bee's knees, you heard that big presence boost. It's almost like there's a shelf at like five or eight K. So it's really a matter of, not one being better than the other, but which one works better in the mix. I've learned after so many years of doing this, most of the time what works great in the mix when you start having a dense thing with lots of instruments sounds stupid by itself. It's like, that's got too much top end on it. Where's all the bottom? The mids are all scooped out, but it works perfectly in the mix. So it always comes down to what works best in the mix. This is gonna be the same thing. See, I can hear a little more detail on the vibrato on the bee's knees. That's partly due to the microphone being a small diaphragm condenser, but also to the distance that the microphone was from Jeff. This microphone was a little bit closer. Now here's the viola with the 414, the large diaphragm. Bee's knees. So what I ended up loving was the 414 on the violin, because it was a little further away, the violin's a little more strident naturally, and the 414 is just kind of bringing out the lower body of the instrument in a really good way. And then the bee's knees on the viola, because it had a little more of that top end, the viola is naturally a little darker in timbre, and it's also a bigger instrument, so it's got a little more low end and doesn't need as much of a boost there. So that's a great example of me learning about microphones. Every time I record something, I use at least two microphones just so I can see what the differences are sonic wise of the mics. And there's always going to be a really nice combo of the instrument you need to record with a specific kind of mic. That's half the fun when it comes to recording stuff live is what microphone you're going to pick and how it's going to work with it. So let's say we just listen to the 414s here. I'll go to the second half of the chorus. Now let's listen to just the bee's knees. Yeah, it's a big difference. And what I ended up cho choosing was the 414 for the violins, the bee's knees for the viola. And what did I do to these guys? Nothing there, nothing there, and nothing there. It looks like everything was right here. And it was just a matter of a little bit of EQ, a little bit of multiband compression. I'll turn these two off. We'll turn off our sends. I like to do this when there's not a particular frequency, like a specific resonant frequency from an instrument that's poking out to me, but I just want to tame the sound in general. I'll do multiple points and just pull them all down. I adjusted the shape on that one just a little bit. But if I grab all these and pull them down, you can hear the frequencies that they're affecting. So 
So while I am addressing four frequencies at once, it's more like a comb filter subtly applied at three or four dB to just help thin the sound out a little bit. And then this guy, I'm sure, is just reacting to some upper mids and a little bit of that top end. Now I'm using a multiband compressor here because I only wanted these two frequencies to be addressed when they reached a certain threshold right here. So when that is peaking way up here, it's pulling it down a lot more, but it's only on certain notes. I didn't want to scoop that much out. This is 6 dB and this is closer to 9. It is 9. I didn't want to scoop that much out all the time. I just did some subtle dips and then the multiband is pulling it down only when it needs it. Looks like we've got some room here from the close mics of the Bricasti preset. And I've said it before, I love how the Bricasti fills in some of those lower mids. It's very, very nice. And then here's the hall. And that's pretty much the finished solo strings to accompany the ensemble string. Our very last video is going to be the actual soloist. We'll do the singers, the oboe, and the violin.